So we are honored and excited to be joined together today with Dr. Taylor Patrick O'Neill to discuss the writing and theology of the medieval mystic and anchorist, Julian of Norwich. Dr. O'Neill is a theologian and member of the teaching faculty at Thomas Aquinas College. He has been featured on the Sacra Doctrina podcast and has recently published a book on the theology of predestination titled Grace, Predestination, and the Permission of Sin, a Thomistic Analysis. Dr. O'Neill, thank you so much for joining with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, excited to be here. So I figured that uh, before we discuss maybe Julian of Norwich's theology and then maybe discussing possible uh, predecessors and influences, uh, or maybe even before we discuss her mysticism, who was Julian of Norwich and why do you think we should, uh, we should study her writings? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And to a certain extent, <laughs> the only answer we can give is largely uh, we don't know. Um, we, we definitely know um, that Lady Julian lived. We know some of the basic details of her life. Um, but we don't have a whole lot um, other than the, the two texts that she's left behind. So what we know of her life is very, is very little. In fact, we don't even know um, exactly what her name was. So she's named after uh, St. Julian's Church in, in Norwich, England. Um, so we don't know exactly what her name was. We don't know a ton about her life other than that um, she was a very pious woman uh, at some point. Uh, it seems to have been when she was a little bit younger. She had a quite serious illness. Um, she expected to die. Uh, and it was uh, at that time in her life that she had... Um, what she called the showings of divine love, a series of um, private visions, um, revelations, I guess you'd call them mystical visions, um, infused contemplation. And uh, she ended up living and she became an anchorite after this. So she, um, she asked to be, this was a, a not uncommon tradition um, in medieval Europe. Uh, she asked to be basically walled into a small room on the side of uh, St. Julian's church. Um, and she spent the rest of her life there. So she was alone. There would be, you know, a window for folks to come in and pray with her, to bring her food, etc. cetera. Um, but she spent the rest of her life there living in this small little room as an anchorite. All right. And so, and then she's dated roughly, as I understand it, uh, 13th and, and, and uh, 14th century. Is, is, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, probably about 100 years or so after the time of St. Thomas, St. Bonaventure. Okay. And what, what can we, you tell us about uh, the date of, uh, of her writings? As, as I understand it, she wrote a sort of short text and then later on wrote a long text. And, some, and both the texts are, 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 are sort of related to one another. What, what can you tell us about uh, the texts themselves? Yeah, so she's got, um, as you said, the short text and the long text. And the difference between them is that the short text is really just kind of um, recounting the specific insights that she had while she was on her, you know, what she thought to be her deathbed. And then um, several years later, we don't know exactly how long it appears to be in her writings. I think she, she hints at some point at how long it was. Uh, that she, after she had uh, written the short text, that she's writing the long text. And uh, I don't remember off the top of my head how long it was, but it's a fairly significant length of time, something like maybe 15 or 20 years. And so the long text then is, um, it's Julian's insights and wisdom that she has gleaned from contemplating upon these visions that she's had for the last, you know, whatever it was, 15, 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. So the, sh the long text is really like almost a kind of commentary on the short text, if you will. All right, then. Well, as I understand it, Julian is sort of famed for being this uh, pious and holy woman and, and especially is, is known as a, as a mystic, as someone who sort of re receives this, sort of this private revelation. But Dennis Turner, I, I, who he's written a very good book on uh, specifically her theological content of, of her writings, he also gives her the title of uh, theologian. And what, what would you say is the difference between a mystic and, and a theologian? Is, is there ever any overlap between the two? Yeah, that's, it's, that's such an excellent question. And I think one of the reasons why Julian is such an interesting figure, and perhaps even 
extra interesting right now is that the relationship between theology and mysticism, the relationship between theology as a science and the spiritual life is um, an important relationship in church history. And I think that it's been one which has been largely overlooked um, over the last 50, 60, 70 years or so. Um, so it, it, it does seem to me that there is an important distinction between a mystic and a theologian. So a mystic is someone who has some sort of experience, um, infused contemplation, where they receive um, particular grace to be able to understand some aspect of the faith, to have some particular communication with God or with uh, our Blessed Mother, hmm. whereas a theologian is someone who is able to um, think through the deposit of the faith, think through revelation in a scientific, in a logical manner. Um, so certainly a good theologian does not have to be a mystic, right? Most theologians are not going to be mystics. Hmm. Um, and and, you know, vice versa, uh, most mystics are not learned theologians either, right? Um, one of my uh, mentors, Father Matthew Lamb, who has uh, passed several years ago, uh, he used to say this often, that um, to be a good theologian is an acquired habit, right? So it's, mm -hmm. in some sense, it requires faith and grace in a way that studying geometry or medicine doesn't. But in another way, as St. Thomas teaches us, it's a real science. So it's something that you have to learn, learn your principles learn mm. how to think theologically and logically. Um, and so, okay, so there's a real distinction here. All of that being said, uh, there are certainly many examples in church history of someone being both a mystic and a theologian. Um, and what you have there is someone who uh, is trained in theology, uh, knows how to think scientifically about the faith and about revelation, mm. and yet also because of an immense love for God and piety and prayer engendered hopefully by theological study, right. Mm. Um, in prayer, right. The good theologian is doing theology, not just as a brain exercise, but in prayer, um, that they sometimes receive these gifts from God, um, mystical visions. And, uh, we know that this happened with St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, right. He was a very learned theologian. Um, and towards the end of his life began to have mystical visions of God. So, and so with respect to Julian, She's not, she doesn't, of course, have any sort of formal scholastic uh, education. In, in fact, if I remember correctly, she describes herself as like a merely unlettered uh, woman, and, yeah. and, and, which is just an informal way of saying she wasn't very educated. But you can nevertheless see uh, through her writings a sort of tension between her trying to intellectually make sense of what seems to be conflicting revelations and, and, uh, and experiences. Yeah. Yeah. It's very clear that, that Julian, um, was not highly educated. Um, and, and I say that's very clear only because she reminds us so often in her great humility. She wants to remind the reader that I'm, I'm on Leonard, uh, uh, unlettered, as you said, I'm unlearned. I don't know these things, you know, maybe someone else who reads this will understand it, um, which is very great. Um, but what is clear is that Julian was, um, very properly catechized, right? Which is unsurprising for uh, a woman in the Middle Ages and, you know, Middle Age uh, uh, England. Mm. So she's very properly catechized and she, she's, she's a good thinker. She's a logical person. She's not, you know, dumb <laughs> by any means. Right. So she's, she's, yeah, she's not a professor of theology, but she's able to contemplate and to think about, especially the visions that she has received. And I think that this is one of the reasons why Dennis Turner, and I would agree with him, uh, says that Julian is indeed a theologian and not merely a mystic or not only a mystic, is that we have the short text of hers, right, where she recounts what she saw. But mm. the long text is a real theological contemplation on these, these revelations that she received. And her contemplation is not itself a revelation or a second um, vision. Mm -hmm. It's it's a theological attempt at comprehending what had happened to her earlier. And the insights that she provides are astounding. Um, you certainly are able to learn significantly more about the faith, about what was revealed to Julian by reading her own contemplation than if you just read the short text. So I think yeah. that's the mark of a, of a good theologian, right? They're able to um, 
parse through the mysteries of the faith and to, mm-hmm. to make them intelligible to us. Right, right. And so with respect to Julian's writings, then, what would you say are some of the overall themes of uh, her, her revelations and, and her trying to, to work through uh, those revelations? Yeah, so I think that, you know, Julian is most famous for her quote, all should be well, all should mm-hmm. be well, and all manner of things should be well. Um, I think what Julian provides is a really penetrating analysis of providence and evil. Um, and these are questions that Julian, I would say, a little bit wrestles with throughout the longer text. Um, essentially, what is the relation of the world to God? To what extent does God have control over the universe, over the created order? Um, and if he has significant control or exhaustive control, um, as indeed she, she claims, mm-hmm. um, why is it that there's any evil in the world? And particularly the evil of sin. Um, why wouldn't it be the case that uh, if God could stop every single ev- evil from happening, why wouldn't it be the case that he does? We clearly, we clearly see that he doesn't. There's all sorts of terrible things happen. We fall into mm-hmm. sin. We see someone, you know, develops a terrible disease. Um, how do we put these two things together? A God of love, right? Revelations of divine love. Right. Um, and a God who seems to permit evil. How do we bring these two things together? I think that's sort of the main heart of Julian's work. How would you say Julian understands God's causal relationship with creation? Is, is there any precedent with her revelations in, uh, in medieval scholastic physics or, or metaphysics? Yeah, I think that Julian... Um, even though she doesn't say cite St. Thomas, um, it's clear that the scholastic, a lot of the scholastic arguments for the very existence of God Mm. are um, really informative to help us understand what God is and what the relationship of the world is to God, right? So St. Thomas tells us that God is the, is, is being itself, right? God, and God is also the uncaused cause. And so what that means is that the entire created order is radically contingent upon God. God isn't just another cause within the universe, you know, albeit a very strong one. Um, But God is the power of causality in all of the created causes in the world. Right. And so what that means for Julian and and what it means for St. Thomas and St. Augustine is that God is in control if you will. God is behind all things. Anything that we see happening in the universe, so long as it has being, so long as it has causality, it's deriving those things from God, right? So we could almost say like God is the singular source of being. Hmm. God is the singular source of act. Hmm. And so anything which has being or anything which is in act must be receiving that from god and if that's the case then we can really say that all of creation is sort of contingent upon god and that god is um uh constantly governing over all things in the universe not just big things but every sort of minute detail is just the way that it is because it's willed so by god and without god willing it uh the universe would just cease to exist Right. Uh, uh, there, there are a few times where uh, Julian sort of uh, sees, is granted a vision of sort of the entirety of the cosmos, and then she sort of compares it to like a, a, a small, like n- a small nut, and 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 she says, you know, there's this one quote from uh, chapter eleven where she says, uh, quote, after and after this, I saw God in a point that is to say in my understanding, and by seeing this, I saw that He is in everything. I looked attentively seeing and recognizing in that vision that he does everything that is done, end quote. And so it it sounds like like, like Julian's revelation very much matches up with uh, the the scholastic understanding of of causality and and, uh, how all the motion and change in the world is ultimately derivative of uh, of the first mover of of God. But there's a problem that arises from this. How do we then account for the existence of evil in the world. And, and one of the struggles that Julian seems to grapple with in her writings is trying to reconcile God's causal relationship with creatures w- w- with the existence of evil in the world. And 
there, there are a number of interesting quotes where, where, where she seems to uh, allude to, uh, to, 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 to sin and evil. And she seems to have uh, a very, in my opinion, Augustinian understanding of what evil is as, as a privation. What, what, what would you say to that? I think that's exactly right. She numerous times throughout the works, uh, throughout the text references the fact that sin in and of itself is not anything right? It is not, um, sin has no substance. Sin in and of itself has no being. So this was, as you, as you know, this is one of the big questions for Augustine when he was still, um, had a kind of Manichaean influence and he kept thinking of evil of sin as like a separate bad substance in the universe. Mm. And one of the big, um, turning points for Augustine in his, uh, in his conversion, and this becomes heavily influential on all of scholastic theology. And I would say all of Christian theology is the notion that sin isn't a competing force in the universe, but sin is um, a defect. It's a perversion. Everything that God creates is good. Everything that has being is good, right? God himself is being uh, simply, and God is goodness simply. So evil or sin is not so much a competing evil substance to the good, but it's a lack of good where there ought to be good, right? So mm -hmm. Uh, sin is like a hole in a wine barrel. In and of itself, the hole is nothing. It's a lack of being where there should be. It's a lack of wine barrel where there should be wine barrel. Now, it's, that still has very real effects in the world. Um, but Julian does begin there by thinking that, okay, there is evil in the world, but evil and sin in and of themselves are not something that is caused by God in the same way that good things, good actions, people... Mm -hmm you know, plants, that these things are caused by God. Okay. So that's sort of how Julian uh, hints at, uh, at, at, at reconciling the existence of evil with God's cause of power is that because evil is, is a privation, it doesn't really exist. And, 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 and in the same way that, that like substances or, or other beings exist. And she even goes so far to say that if it weren't for, for uh, suffering, it couldn't be really recognized. Uh, and, and I wanted to ask, how would you say that Julian's answer to, to the problem of suffering and evil different, differs from more contemporary answers, so, such as those of uh, Alvin Plantinga? Yeah, so uh, Alvin Plantinga is... Elvin Plantinga is sort of oftentimes named as the inventor, the originator of the so-called free will defense. I mean, I, I think he's given a, the strongest contemporary defense of the free will defense. I certainly don't think he's the originator of it. You can see this in C.S. Lewis, for example. Um, mm. The free will defense essentially says that God's providence and causality are not exhaustive, that um, especially in regard to free creatures, that... Um, if we want to claim that free creatures really, really are free, that is, they really do have a free will, that means that God's causality must not be able to touch it, must be completely unrelated to it. So you need to carve out little spaces in the created order where humans can move, but not under providence, where humans can cause things, but not by participating in God's power of causality. Um, and only by doing that can we retain uh, human freedom, angelic freedom. Um, now, the problem with that is that it makes our own being and our own causality competitive with God's. Mm. Um, but as we already indicated, right, this is sort of over, oversimplifying the question a little bit, but as we've already stated, if it is indeed true, as classical theism and as Christianity claims, that there's only one single source of being, you know, being as such, there's only one single source of goodness. Goodness is such that these things are God. That would mean that to whatever extent that I act at all, freely, for the good, for the evil, etc., it has to be, it could only be, by being participating, by receiving my ability to act from God in each and every act, not just sometimes, not just here and there, um, you know, is a very, uh, this is a, a bad analogy that I sometimes use with my students <laughs> is mm. a very limited analogy. But do you think about human beings as something which does not have its own power to act or to cause built into it? 
uh, kind of like, you know, a toaster or something doesn't have mm-hmm. its own energy source built into it. It has mm-hmm. to be plugged into the outlet, something which is able to give it the energy which it needs to do what's in its nature to do. In this case, you know, to turn to, uh, you know, toast, toast or whatever, toast bread. Right. Okay. It's a very similar kind of thing with human beings. The human beings in and of themselves um, have no being and no goodness. So to whatever extent that God wills that we have being, that we cause things, that we choose freely, these things must be themselves caused by God. Um, okay, so if that's true, then the free will defense seems to fail. In other words, if providence extends to everything, including to our free acts, then the question of evil arises back again um, in a way in which it, it doesn't with the free will defense, right? That's the upshot with the free will defense. You can say, well, um, you know, if God is actually powerless to stop our evil actions, then, you know, that, that answers the problem of evil. Why do people harm each other? Why are there, um, you know, wars, genocides? Well, because, you know, God has to let us sort of do our thing, and there's not much that God can do about it. For St. Thomas, for Augustine, and for Julian, that's just not a good answer. It doesn't metaphysically account for human beings as radically contingent upon God. Okay. So this, this, this view, the scholastic view of being radically contingent upon God while precluding the free will defense, it, it, it raises the question of evil back uh, up, right? That sort of comes back to the surface again. And you go, mm. okay, well, if it's indeed the case that everything that humans do does indeed fall under divine providence, that God didn't just get lucky that, you know, Mary's fiat was a yes, uh, mm. uh, but that actually God caused Mary to be good and she also with God caused herself to say yes uh, to Gabriel and say yes to God. Um, Okay. Well, that, that, that's good. That accounts for the good acts, but then we have to go back and account for the evil acts as well. What is God doing? If he could make it otherwise, why the heck isn't he? What's he doing when people start going to war and committing acts of violence? And that's where the, the, you know, the real question of evil uh, comes back. And that's where I think Julian is, gives us, has fantastic insights. Now that maybe we can sort of switch from talking about theodicy to maybe soteriology and and, uh, and atonement. And one of the the more the most interesting theological insights Julian provides is the uh, the fittingness or the word she uses is behovely nature of of evil in the world. She says in. uh, In chapter 27, I, I believe, of the revelations out of the long text, she, she says, you know, sin is behovely, but all should be well, all should be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Uh, why does Julian understand evil in this way? Yeah, so this word behovely is, is a really interesting word. We don't really use it anymore. Um, we do use a related word a little bit uh, in English. Um, of course, Julian was writing in Middle English. Hmm. Um, so we have some, you know, uh, relations to the word behovely. So sometimes we'll say uh, it behooves you, you know, to do X, Y, or Z. Um, and behooves comes from the same root as behovely. And so, you know, when we say it would behoove you to do this or that, I mean, what we mean by that usually, I think, is it's not absolutely necessary that you do this, but it would be good for you if you did. It would be fitting. It would be convenient. Um, and so Dennis Turner says that behovely is essentially working for Julian the same way that the Latin word conveniens works for St. Thomas, which hmm. conveniens is oftentimes translated as fitting, right? St. Thomas speaks this way all the time. It, it's the incarnation is fitting. It wasn't absolutely necessary, but it wasn't completely like pointless and arbitrary either. It's fitting. Hmm. It fits with the way things are. So I think that this is the, the, the singular most important insight of Julian this, this particular sentence, which you just read, that sin is behovely, and yet all shall be well. We, we get the all shall be well part, and we hear that a lot, but we don't hear the sin is behovely part. Mm-hmm. So on the surface, you might think, well, sin is fitting. Uh, sin is behovely. This sounds sort of like scandalous, right? Mm-hmm. Um, right. But would, Julian makes it... Yeah, go ahead. Well, we, right, yeah, I was just following up, like, why would it be convenient for sin to, to exist in the world, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so Julian makes it quite clear that sin in and of itself is, is horrible. It's evil. Mm. Um, so there's nothing good about sin qua sin. 
But what Julian hints at is that God's providence being exhaustive and God's goodness being infinite, God permits evils. So he doesn't cause evils. He doesn't cause sinful actions as we might see in John Calvin. Hmm. But nor going to the other extreme, nor is he completely tied. You know, he doesn't have his hands tied. He's not overcome. His divine omnipotence is not overcome by my creaturely free will, which is, you know, I receive all my being and all of my ability to will from God. And yet somehow his hands are tied in regard to my free will. That's metaphysically strange, right? Sort of an absurdity. Okay. So in between these two extremes is this view that God does not cause evil, but God does permit it. In other words, God, God could uh, give us grace necessary not to commit some evil action. And in fact, oftentimes he does, right? I mean, every time that I do something good, if God is really the source of all goodness, then I have to attribute all of my good actions to God, right? And we mm -hmm. see this all the way back to St. Paul, all the way back to the New Testament, right? Mm -hmm. No Christian should boast because all goodness they have comes as a free gift from God. This is what the word grace means, right? It means it's gratis, it's gratuitous. Right. So, okay, so um, God oftentimes overcomes our evil actions by, you know, moving our free will to will the good. But he doesn't always do so. And yet, all of the evil that takes place in the world, God will ultimately bring some higher good out of it. Mm. Some good that is even higher, more important, more significant than if that evil had not been permitted in the first place. Mm. And so nothing for Julian more demonstrates both God's omnipotence and his goodness than that he's able to turn evil things ultimately, when all is said and done, into good things, right? And the primary example of this for Julian is Christological. The primary example is in and through the traitorous action of Judas, in and through the violent actions of the Roman soldiers, we have the most beautiful event imaginable, right? the laying down of Christ's life for the sake of, of his love for humanity. Mm. Um, and so this is really like, you know, what, what, what you might call Felix Culpa theology. Oh, happy fault that we hear the Easter exalted. Right. This paradox between evil in and of itself being evil, being bad. And yet God being so good that he never allows, as St. Augustine says, he never allows evil to just um, go by without drawing even higher goods from that evil than if it not had happened. Beautiful. All right, then. Well, following up on uh, on the incarnation and, and atonement, does Julian in her writings ever give us a sort of theological, a theology of atonement in her writings or any insights regarding the passion or the incarnation? Because if I remember my, my readings of it, a lot of her uh, visions are about uh, the passion and she, 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 uh, she sees Christ suffering, she sees Christ crucified and that, 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 that's a theme that uh, that sort of haunts a lot of her her musings on on her theology is is the theology of uh, of, of Christ. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, she has um she has a particular vision, um, which is this this son who is um, called to do the bidding of his father, and out of love for the father, he's eager to do the father's bidding and the father out of love for his son is eager to send him on his behalf to do this, this mission. Um, and while running, the son sort of falls into this, this pit mm. um, and becomes really injured and calls out to the father uh, in his injury. And so clearly she's alluding here to Christ. Um, and so, yeah, you have this, this, central Christological theme within Julian, where it, it is the case that sin is behovely precisely for the fact that greater goods are, are brought out of sin. Um, but the, the primary manifestation of this is in fact the incarnation itself. And this is another th place where I think Julian is heavily Thomistic. Right? Mm. In St. Thomas, you get a sense that all of creation is for the sake of Christ. All of creation is for the sake of 
the incarnation, God becoming man, and God redeeming humanity in and through this suffering of love. And that suffering of love doesn't take place without some degree of evil in the world. Had man not fallen, we would not have so great a redeemer. Mm. Um, and in fact, there's a real way in which, you know, this is something debated by the scholastic theologians, but there's a real way in which for St. Thomas, we can, we can actually say that had man not fallen, man wouldn't be raised to the level of supernatural beatitude, right? We'd, we'd still be in the garden and things would be quite, quite good, mm -hmm. but it's in and through original sin and our personal sin um, that it, it occasions uh, what, what allows us ultimately, that is the incarnation, what allows us ultimately to participate, not just in perfect human nature, or to have possessed perfect human nature, but to participate in the divine nature itself. And so um, she uses a lot of um, beautiful imagery, the, 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 the deep red blood, which mm. pours forth from the crown of thorns, is a huge example, is a perfect example of how all things shall be well and how what's beautiful is often sort of on the surface surface looks paradoxically ugly um and and she uh, she one last thing i'll mention in this regard she 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 references and i think this is a, an incredible insight that one could contemplate for the rest of their lives christ in his perfect body in his resurrected perf perfectly spiritualized body retains the wounds of the crucifixion and is more beautiful for retaining the wounds than if the wounds were just sort of disappeared. Um, and I think that's a kind of microcosm for what God is doing with the entire created order, at least for Julian. All right, then. Well, would, as I understand it, there's also a, a scholastic debate. And, and again, Julian isn't really a scholastic, but there's, there's a debate about what was the sort of primary motive for the incarnation. So Thomas Aquinas uh, and many others sort of said, you know, what, why God became incarnated was to glorify God, but, but, but it was specifically glorifying God to, uh, th by, by, by saving us from our sin. It, it was a remedy for, for sin. And then there were some other theologians uh, like, like Duns Scotus who said that sort of the primary motive of uh, of the incarnation isn't so much uh, re redemption, but is to to, uh, to 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 glorify God in creation and to to bring us up uh, into a participation in in, in God's in, in our life, and and that's sort of the main purpose, as I understand it, that's the main purpose of uh, of uh, the incarnation, as Duns Scotus uh, uh, argues. W would you say that that Julian? falls anywhere between in, the, in this debate or does she sort of fall neatly into one category or camp? Yeah, that's another really good question. I, I think that Julian, um, and here, you know, as you, as you mentioned, she's not um, a scholastic theologian, nor does she write in a very sort of systematic style. Yeah. So it's yeah. not like she ever specifically addresses this question. Said contra, right, but, right. Right, right. But I think that uh, my reading of Julian uh, is certainly that she would not say it's either or here, that in fact it's both, right? Mm -hmm. So just as for St. Thomas, of course, it's the case that the incarnation is for the sake of um, making possible man's supernatural end, making possible participation in the divine nature, not mm -hmm. just the perfecting of human nature. Um, Julian would, would completely agree with that. Um, and she speaks about uh, divinization uh, in multiple places, but it's intimately linked up with the remedy for evil. So it's it's almost as if um, it's almost as if for Julian, there's something about God's permitting evil and then bringing the highest possible good from it. That is the very deification of the created order at least of human beings, um, that that's the highest possible end for the created order, right? The highest possible end for the created order would be to participate or to possess the highest possible good, which is mm -hmm. God. And we could say there's an almost infinite, there's, there is an infinite number of lesser particular goods that could be the end of the created order. 
but the created order is called towards the highest good, which is possession of God himself. Um, and there's something about the fact that God uh, is able to do this even when the order itself is defectible and isn't just defectible in nature, but does indeed defect. There seems to be something about this that manifests God's omnipotence and God's love even more than if God took a merely perfect universe that is perfect where there were never any kind of sins or natural evils and then elevated that to the beatific vision. Um, and again, this is where contemplating the wounds of Christ is important. There's, there's something about the fact that Christ's, there's something about the wounds of Christ, even in his perfected body, which makes him more perfect than if he had had a perfectly spiritual body, but without the wounds. And I think we can, we could apply that to all of, all of creation. Um, I, I think that in the art world, there's a kind of analogate for this. Um, there's a particular kind of art in, in Japan, um, regular sort of everyday use pottery, uh, when it was cracked, when it would break up into pieces, there were certain artists who would take these broken pots and they would fill in the cracks with gold and remake these everyday clay metal pots, but with gold in the cracks. And that elevated what was just everyday utilitarian pots to these beautiful works of art. Mm. Um, so there's this mystery that um, by being broken and remade, it manifests um, some beauty and some intelligence of the artist um, greater than if it had not been broken in the first place. And that, that central mystery, how that will happen, um, how that most manifests God's glory is, is, is not something that can, can be completely understood in this life, but we can at least start to, to begin to understand that that might be the case or that, that that's what God really has in store for, for the created order. Um, so uh, there seems to be some higher good, some higher beauty that's made manifest by um, overcoming evil with goodness rather than just not allowing evil to enter the scene at all. Gotcha. All right, Ben. Well, on the subject of, uh, of, per of permitting evil and uh, for, 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 for another greater good, it's, it's often said that Julian's often repeated quote that all should be well is, uh, is hinting at or it's endorsing uh, the theological notion of universalism, that, that, that all humans will, uh, will eventually be saved from, from hell and, and sort of enter into, enter into heaven. Would you say this is an accurate assessment or, or reading of Julian's theological insights? Or would you say that, that that's kind of a, an anachronistic uh, uh, reading? Yeah, I think it's totally anachronistic. I think it's, um, to be frank, I think it's absurd. I think it, it requires that one um, either not read Julian or that one um, essentially lie about what Julian has to say. Mm. Um, in the Revelations, there are numerous places where Julian uh, asserts that she does not depart from church teaching in any way, which certainly um, includes the church's teaching on the reality of, of damnation, the reality of mortal sin, etc. Mm. Uh, but beyond that, specifically on the question of damnation, she states several times explicitly that she does not depart from church teaching, that she won, she completely assents to the church's teaching, mm -hmm. that she um, recognizes that there are souls who will be damned and that their, their damnation will last for all of eternity. She explicitly mentions Satan as one who is lost forever. Mm -hmm. um, so so the, this idea that, that Julian is kind of um, trying to put forth universalism, I think is just patently absurd, right? In the text, it's clear. And, and indeed, I think that this is one of the reasons why Julian is trying so hard to understand the revelations given to her. Um, she does see there's evil in the world. And more than that, she sees that in some way, there's some degree of evil, which pertains in a sense forever right? Hell, the souls that are lost in hell. And yet she's also hearing 
that all shall be well, like everything shall be well in the end. Mm. Um, and if universalism were true, well, you would just sort of, you know, you'd, you'd dust your hands off and go, okay, well, it's clear. I understand how all shall be well. There's no problem here, right? right? But it's this seeming disjunct. Julian knows that actually both of these pieces, that is um, the existence of real damnation, at least for a few souls, at least for, you know, some of the, the angels, Hmm. Um, that this exists alongside, in and with the claim that all shall be well. And it's fitting those two pieces together, which makes up almost the entirety of the work. Um, so both by just looking at the text and then by thinking about what Julian is struggling with in this text, um, claiming that this is some sort of universalism or even quasi-universalism, I think is just, is, 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 yeah, quite frankly, absurd. All right, then. Well... Well, on that note, then, would you have any, uh, I, I suppose right now we, we could sort of give our concluding thoughts to uh, this excellent discussion of, uh, of this great mystic and, and theologian. Uh, but I just have a few more questions. Um, the, the first one is, would you, would you say at all that Julian comes across as uh, optimistic at all in, in, in her writings? I mean, Julian, at least from what I've read, she, she sort of seems optimistic about salvation history and Christians living in the world. And would it be possible that this optimism was meant to, uh, to, to assure her Christians of God's providence? Because at, at least uh, D D Julian living, you know, in, in the, the late, later four, uh, 13th and, 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 and early 14th century, this was after, you know, plagues, the, the peasant revolts, the, the great Western schism w w was going on, the Lollard movement was on the rise in England. And is, is, it, is, is her optimism sort of trying to uh, assure, uh, uh, assure, is it possible that, that her optimism is trying to assure Christians of God's providence at all? Yeah, I, I, I'm sure that this was on her mind. I'm sure that um, this was a very difficult time, you know, the so-called dark ages. Um, and that it was um, the question of evil was strongly on people's mind mm. and that uh, a contemplation on the exhaustive nature of providence, a contemplation on what it means for a, for love itself to be ordering the universe would be incredibly helpful. Um, but, you know, all times are filled with evil. And I think that um, this, <laughs> this notion that the world seems to have many sort of bad things in store for us, that what we most desire is not readily available, is not easily seeable by us. Um, this is what necessitates the, the very theological virtue of hope. So um, I, I certainly, I'm sure that these things were on Julian's mind. I'm sure that they were... Um, particularly or uniquely needed in her time period, but I think that they're, uh, you know, particularly needed in our own time period and uh, in time periods in between. So I think that this was probably on Julian's mind, but I think that more than a, a kind of merely, you know, uh, utilitarian desire to help her, her, her fellow Christians or her even Christians, as she calls them, um, I think she's just driven by an absolute desire to understand God's love and to understand um, how it is the case, because she knows, she trusts completely. She trusts com completely the idea that even in our darkest hours, even when it feels as if we've been abandoned by God, that God is there ordering what's happening to us to some higher good. That we will, in a sense, it will all have been worth it in the end. Um, and I think that every Christian in every time needs that, right? That's what the virtue of hope is all about. Um, and I think it's just her desire, her love for God, her love for this one who loves her so much to, to draw the highest goods out of her suffering. She just is, she just wants to know her beloved more. She wants to understand this. And in the end, she, she sort of recognizes like, well, I can contemplate this and I want to contemplate this, but I won't really be able to understand everything that God is up to. I won't be able to understand precisely how God brought more good than evil out of this bad event in my life or that bad event until I can see the entire picture, right? After this life, when I can see providence, all of salvation history as a whole, 
And then these things will become clear to us, but we have to wait, right? Until, until the beatific vision. Right, right. All right, then. Well, I suppose uh, what's left is just to give uh, concluding thoughts. Are there any uh, reading, re reading suggestions for uh, learning more about Julian Norwich and her writings? I, I know we mentioned uh, Dennis Turner's book, Julian of Norwich, the Theologian. And uh, are there any translations you'd recommend or translations you'd want, want us to, to avoid? Because as I understand it, there, there are some sort of sketchy, uh, like new age translations of, uh, of her works. Yeah, there's uh, unfortunately many more of those than there are good ones. Um, yeah, I, I would recommend if someone is interested in this topic, I, I have a small article in First Things that appeared in December of this last year, and I, that's a, available online. Um, oh, for free as well yeah i could send a link for that or something so it's in the print edition in december and also online um that's a good sort of intro to uh to julian and then if you're interested beyond that yeah i i would just want to echo dennis turner's book julian of norwich theologian i think it's fantastic i think it's probably the best thing that's ever been written about julian um if you want to read the text itself which i also highly recommend uh, in fact i would recommend doing that before reading the turner book um there's two that i think i can pretty easily recommend. Um, one of them is the one that I often use, which um, you can find on Amazon. It's in the, um, uh, what would you say? It's, it's uh, in the, uh, it's not under copyright or anything. So there's a number of sort of self-publishing presses on Amazon that you can find this with, but uh, it's one that's been translated and edited by Grace Warwick. Um, and that one is sticks pretty closely to um, the original Middle English. Mm -hmm. um, I, I find it very readable, um, but it's, it's an authentic translation. Um, and then the other one is um, Paulist Press has a series that I'm sure many of your listeners are aware of called wow. The Classics of Western Spirituality. Um, and they have their own. Oh, so sorry. What's that? I just said that they had very, very good text, but very weird artwork for, for the covers. I yes. <laughs> the artwork is very strange. And uh, my own two cents is that I, I very much do not like it. But the, the translations are oftentimes pretty good. I would definitely recommend those. There's some other ones, especially one by Mirabai Star. I, they are uh, they're translated, I mean, sometimes opposite of clearly what Julian is saying just to uh, you know, hammer through a, a pro feminist, you know, just sort of like superficial pro feminist or superficial pro universalist argument. So I would definitely stick, uh, you know, clear from those. So the Paulus Press one or the Grace Warwick one are the two I'd recommend. Dr. Taylor, Patrick O'Neill, thank you so much for joining with us. This was a, this was, a, this was a great. Thank you so much for having me. It was an honor.